Well, you're going to be glad you came today. Uh, we're going to start a brand new series, a brand new study in the book of Daniel. So grab your Bible, get your Bible, turn your Bible on, get to the Word of God. If you need a Bible, we'll give you a Bible. We want everybody to uh, be in the Word of God this fall. We're going to start this incredible journey uh, in the book of Daniel. Uh, no Hollywood movie, no book of fiction has any more adventure, excitement uh, than the book of Daniel. You just can't find it anywhere else. And the book answers the question of how do you survive when your world is shaken? How do you have unshakable faith in this shaken up world? How many of you know our world right now is really shaken up, right? And so how do you survive that? This, uh, this book, the foundation of this book, and how many of you know this, is that God in heaven is ruling right now on earth. Anybody believe that? God in heaven is ruling right now on earth. And it doesn't matter if you're an unbeliever. It doesn't matter if you're an agnostic. Uh, it doesn't matter if you're an atheist. Uh, you, believe it or not, are still under the control of God. God is sovereign and he's orchestrating all the events of the world. The, the, this book is for those of us that have to live in a secular environment, those of us that work in a secular environment, those that live under a government that doesn't respect God or his people. Not only that, the book gives us prophetic insight into how God rules and how he overrules, how God controls all the events in human history even today, and even events in human history that have not even happened yet. God controls all of that. Now, in order to do this study, we've got something we really want you to do. We have uh, found a great um, Bible pl reading plan from Capitol Hill Church, Mark Battison's church out of Washington, D.C. Uh, it is a great reading plan from the book of Daniel. It is a chapter a week. Anybody can do that. Not a chapter a day. It's a chapter a week. The book of Daniel is only 12 weeks long. It is a chapter a week, five days a week. And uh, it's a great reading plan. I want to encourage you as a family to go through this reading plan. I really want to encourage our Sunday school classes. Can you not just get rid of the bullet? I mean, get rid of the, you know, um, the, the, your, uh, your thing that you do uh, for like 12 weeks or 11, 11 weeks, g get rid of the quarterly or whatever. And, and even as a class, go through this study in the book of Daniel. My, my D group, my discipleship group, we're doing that. Uh, we're, gonna, we're taking a chapter a week and we're talking about it. It is that timely. It is, it is that up to date. It's that important. So if you will go uh, to our uh, website, b3church.org, starting tomorrow, uh, then you'll be able to access that uh, reading plan. Now, we will send out a flock note tomorrow uh, reminding you of the reading plan, but this is important. Many of you are not on flock note. You need to get on flock note, like right now, take your smartphone out, get it out, uh, go to, uh, you, you can text ALBC at 84576. Uh, you can get on flock note. That's how we really communicate with people around here is through flock note. We won't hammer you with flock notes two or three times a day. But we will send out a reminder for this reading plan. Monday through Friday, one chapter a week with a memory verse. And, uh, and so that's going to be very, very exciting. I, I pray you'll take, you'll take advantage of the reading plan as a church family as we go through the book of Daniel. Do I have anybody that's ready to get into this adventure right now? Let me hear you say, yeah. yeah. All, right. All right, everybody take your Bible. Book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1. And uh, let's all stand uh, for the reading of God's Word. Book of Daniel, chapter 1, verse 1. All right, everybody standing. Uh, everybody have it. If you have it, say, got it. Good. In the third year of the reign of King Jehoiakim of Judah, King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylon came to Jerusalem and laid siege to it. The Lord handed King Jehoiakim of Judah over to him, along with some of the vessels from the house of God. Nebuchadnezzar carried them to the land of Babylon, to the house of God, little g, uh, to his house of God, little g, and the vessels and the treasury of his God, little g. The king ordered Asphenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the Israelites from the royal family and from the nobility, young men, without any physical defect, good-looking. 
I would have been left behind. <laughs> Suitable for instruction in all wisdom, knowledgeable, perceptive, capable of serving the king's palace. He was to teach them the Chaldean language and culture. And the king assigned them daily provisions from the royal food and from the wine that he drank, there to be trained for three years. And at the end of that time, they were ten to the king. Among them from the Judaites were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. The chief eunuch gave them names. He gave the name of Belshazzar to Daniel, Shadrach to Hananiah, Meshach to Mishael, and Abednego to Azariah. Daniel determined he did not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine he drank. So he asked permission from the chief eunuch not to defile himself. Father, we're going on a tremendous journey. From the word of God, Lord, that we hopefully we will see at the end of these weeks that is right on schedule, that, Lord, you are not up in your heaven wringing your hands and asking yourself, I don't know how this got away from me. Not at all. So help us to see, Father, how sovereign and how in control you really, really are in all of our lives. We praise you. We thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Now, let me give you some background. Uh, most of you already know this. King David was the greatest king that Israel ever knew. He had a son named Solomon. Solomon was wise and he ruled with a wise heart for a while. Then he got off track and he blew it. Didn't finish well. So after Solomon's death, Israel was divided into two kingdoms, north and south. I mean, you know, some things just never change, right? So you had the northern kingdom, which was called Israel. And they were 10 tribes of Israel. Then you had the southern kingdom called Judah. There were two tribes of Israelites in Judah. Now, Judah was very special to God because that's where Jerusalem was, and that's where the temple was. And so for 300 years, they got off track. I mean, they, they, had, they had lost the fact that David was a man after God's own heart. They forgot about the Shekinah glory of God that came down on the dedication of Solomon's temple on that day. They'd forgotten all of that. And for the most part, for 300 years, they fell in love with a pagan world. They fell in love with pagan gods. Now, the northern kingdom was worse, worse than the southern kingdom about that, but they were both guilty of serving other gods, having idol worship. And God raised up prophets and told them, you better get right. Because he said, oh, the only thing is, God said, look, if you just throw me a bone, if, if you'll just lean my way, if you'll just get rid of these pagan idols and start worshiping me, you will have the blessing and the favor and the hand of God on your nation. But they wouldn't do it. For, and so for 300 years, they, they just denied God. And so God raised up these prophets and said, you need to repent and get right. If you don't, you're going to pay a price. And so finally, one day, they did pay a price. The northern kingdom, the Assyrian army, conquered the northern kingdom and scattered the ten tribes all over the place. Now, God is a God of grace, and God is a God of mercy, and, his, and, and he, yes, he does judge, but he, he, his, his, he waits a long time. So he gave Judah, the southern kingdom, 130 years to repent, but they never did. And prophets kept saying, you saw what happened in the northern kingdom with the Assyrians. The same thing's going to happen in the southern kingdom if you don't turn your hearts toward God. And they never did. And then came the day, came the day, overnight, when Nebuchadnezzar, the one world ruler, king of the greatest kingdom at that time in all the known world came in, ransacked Jerusalem, ransacked the temple, just like God had said would happen. Uh, and Nebuchadnezzar takes some of the cream of the crop, some of the young people, just like we have in our service today, I think. How many of you think? Our young people are the cream of the crop. Come on, let me hear a hand clap of praise to Jesus. Yeah. Y'all are the cream of the crop, and we love you. Now, some of you ain't worth shooting, but it don't matter. We love you. You are the cream of the crop. And so, guys, just like y'all, by the way, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were probably anywhere between 12 and 14 years old. I lean toward the middle of that 
They were at least 13 years old. 13 years old. And so Nebuchadnezzar takes them, probably kills their parents, takes them, yanks them out of their culture, yanks them out of everything they knew. You see, all they've known is to be under the shadow of the temple in Jerusalem. They are steeped and trained and love the living God and the word of the known word of the living God at their time. And so now overnight, Nebuchadnezzar takes that cream of the crop and yanks them out and takes them as captives, as slaves to Babylon because he thinks that they're at the perfect age where he can indoctrinate them and cause them to forget their God and start serving the God that Nebuchadnezzar thinks he is. So, having said that, laid that background, let me give you several thoughts. And you need to be a note taker during this series. Uh, when any of our preachers are preaching during this series, take notes. Do, do that Bible reading plan. Sign up for that. Don't slough that off, man. Uh, and, uh, and, and take notes, see what happens. So let me give you several thoughts very quickly this morning. Number one, how many of you know this is true? You don't have to fall apart when your world falls apart. Did y'all get that? You don't have to fall apart when your world is falling apart. And God knows that in these days and times, our world seems to be falling apart. Every time we turn around, there's, there's something, there's a new regulation, there's a new rule, there's, there's, there's government overreach and, and all of these things and, and that causes us to think maybe God is in his heaven and maybe he don't care anymore. Maybe, maybe he's out to lunch or whatever, but no, no, no. God is telling us you don't have to fall apart when your world falls apart. Daniel's raised in the shadow of the temple, his education, everything in his way of life was in the... the uh, the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible, and any, any scriptures that he had by then. And so that was his way of life. And overnight, a foreign military comes in and occupies their land, occupies and takes over, destroys the temple that he loved so much, destroys the place where he was learning and being educated and rips him out. Overnight, it happened. By the way, by the way, listen to me. Listen to me say amen. Have we not seen this? Lately, surely you're, you're not on the other side of Mars somewhere. Surely you're connecting the dots. While I was studying this, while I was trying to put together the last parts of this message and, and, and do all that, I, the new, I was watching the news of how the takeover of Afghanistan from the Taliban and how that happened overnight. And I got to thinking about Daniel and his, th his, his three friends being 12, 13 years old. And I got to thinking about a 12 or 13 year old just in the last couple of weeks that pretty much was raised with a, an, a, an American influence in his culture, had the freedom to you know, get education, had the freedom to kind of wear what they wanted to wear, and, and they were, they were kind of indoctrinated or in, in steeped into the American way of life. Not totally, but, but they enjoyed certain freedoms this country affords. And then overnight, overnight, the Taliban come in. They start going door to door looking for people that were American friendly, looking for people that were translators, and, and, uh, and overnight arresting, overnight even shooting them overnight, taking them out of what they have known. And it happens, and we've seen it happen before our very eyes. Everything that Daniel had known, all of a sudden, a foreign military force comes in. And we've seen that happen even before our very eyes. So now, when that happens, then the question is, is it worth it to serve God? The question is, why bother. When you think about it, Daniel and his friend, they didn't ask for this. Uh, the, the prophets had told, they told Judah, you, you need to turn to, to God uh, or, or, or you'll pay the price. Well, well, Daniel and his friend, they turned to God. They, they believed in God. They were raised with the one true living God. Their parents had, had instilled in them a love for the word of God at that time, a love for God. And they, they, they worshiped God. They went to the temple. They did all the right things. And then the next thing you know, they're taken out with the guilty. And they're not guilty. 
And it'd be so easy for them to throw up their hands and say, well, why bother? And we're trying to do all the right thing. You ever feel that way? You don't have to say amen right now. You'd be lying in church. Why bother? Why, why, why serve the Lord? Why know the Lord? Why study the Word of God? Why come to church? Why, what difference does it make? The world's going to hell in a handbasket anyway. And it'd be so easy for them to think that. And so uh, now they got a decision. Uh, the question is, are they going to still serve the one true living God? Is it worth it? And it's a question that you and I are faced with today. Is God who God says he is? Is he going to do what he says he'll do? Is he who he says he is? And that is the question that they're facing. Somebody said, Christians are like tea bags. You really don't know what's in them until you put them in hot water. <laughs> Can I get an amen? You know what I'm saying? Uh, and that's true. They're, uh, they're in hot water. Now, I want you to see something. All right. Take your Bible. Go to verse 2. Because this is, this is kind of the foundation of what we're, what we're, uh, we're laying in this, in this introductory message today. Look at verse 2. I want you to notice a little phrase here. And you might have skipped over it if you're not careful. Nebuchadnezzar comes in. Uh, Jehoiakim is the king of Judah. Now look what happens in verse 2. The Lord, everybody say the Lord. The Lord handed Jehoiakim over to Nebuchadnezzar. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. You mean, you mean the Lord allowed it? No, no. I mean, you, you, you mean the Lord, the, the Lord allowed Jehoiakim to be handed over to his enemy, to be handed over to this pagan king. And I hear people say, well, you know, maybe the, maybe the Lord allowed it. or maybe the, No, no, no. God didn't allow it. Listen to me. God orchestrated it. God did it. Now, ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. You can say all day long, well, maybe the Lord is allowing us to go through this. No, 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 no. Listen to me and listen well. God is not just allowing us to go through this. God is in control, and he's orchestrating all this. And all God's people say... He's orchestrating. You say God overtraded COVID? Yes. You think, think God's up in heaven and said, I don't know what COVID is. Nobody else does. Maybe I'll ask Fauci. You, you, think, you think God's in heaven saying that? No. He knows exactly what it is. He knows exactly what he's doing. He knows exactly what we're going through. He knows exactly what, how the churches are struggling in America right now on all over the world. He knows that. Yes, he's allowing it. But understand this. God is on his throne. And God is going to do what God does. And you're not going to fight against it. But brother, you better make sure you're on his side and you're in him. And all God's people say that's right. So your world doesn't have to fall apart. Or you don't have to fall apart when your world falls apart. Because God's in control. Here's the second thing. Here's the second thing. You don't have to accept. And, and by the way, let me, where's, all my young people, any, anybody that's like all the way up to 16 years old, raise your hand. I mean, or, or just, oh, we got young people. How many of you think you're young people? Raise your hand. Okay. <laughs> some, some of you senior adults are just lying, man. Come on. You, you hadn't been a young person, you know, since Carter was president. But anyway, so, <laughs> anyway. So I, I, want you to, I want you to see this. I want you to listen to me. You, you do not have to call yourself what the culture calls you. You don't have to do that. Because the culture is going to try to call you something else, and they're doing that every single day. You notice here, notice what Nebuchadnezzar does. The first thing he does with these Hebrew boys, he changes their name. He changes their name. He doesn't beat them with whips. He doesn't imprison them. He don't throw them, you know, uh, uh, to the fiery furnace yet. Uh, he's not throwing them to the lion's den yet. I mean, he's not doing anything. All he's doing is telling Aphanes, the first thing I want you to do is you change your name. Why? Because all, through, all four of them, their names are steeped in the worship of God. And Nebuchadnezzar said, listen, they're young. They're young. So the first thing we do, let's get them to forget their God. 
Let's get them to embrace our God, the God of our culture, the pagan God. And if we can do anything in the world, let's get them to forget their God. And you see it in their names. By the way, biblical names meant something. Now, I'm, our, our names, you know, just are by what our, our parents call us. Uh, my, my mama named me Jeffrey. Why? I don't know. I think she was mad at me that day. I'd like to have been called Rocky. Right? You know, but Jeffrey, it sounds so Jeffrey. I think there's a giraffe named Jeffrey. But anyway, so, uh, but that's how we name. But in biblical times, you named your child every hope and dream and aspiration that you could call into that child. You, you voiced it to that child. And every time you called their name, you were voicing to them my dreams, my aspirations for that child. And Daniel and Hananiah and Mishael and Azariah were named that way. If you'll notice, everybody go back. Look, at, look, at your, look in the scripture. Look at, there's something you will see in each one of their names. Uh, it either ends with E-L, L, or it ends in A-H, ah. Now that means something. Uh, Daniel, Daniel, E-L, uh, Hananiah, A-H, Mishael, E-L, and Azariah, A-H. Now, uh, that, that means something. First of all, any time in the Bible you see something ending in E-L, L, uh, then that's, that is the name of God. It's Elohim. It's actually the, the mighty God. When you, when, you, when you see a name like Bethel, uh, that, that's, that's referring to mighty God. That's Elohim. That's who God is. That's the Hebrew. Daniel's Hebrew name, Daniel, meant mighty God. It, actually, it meant God is my judge. The mighty God is my judge. Uh, Mishael uh, is, is it E-L. Hananiah uh, ends in A-H. Now, E-L is mighty God. A-H, that translates into Yahweh. Anybody ever heard that name before? Yahweh literally means the Lord God. So all four of these guys, their names meant the Lord is my God or a mighty God or he's the Lord God in my life. And the first thing that Nebuchadnezzar does say, let's forget all that. Let's get rid of that. Get rid of how you're raised. Get rid of what your parents taught you. Get rid of what your preacher taught you. Get rid of what your church taught taught you. Now we're going to teach you something different. And we're living in that day. Right? So they changed their names. Daniel, which means God is my judge, they named him Belshazzar, which means Baal protects the king. Baal, and the most ungodly of all the little g-gods, in all of Israel, I, I don't, in mixed company, I cannot tell you what Baal worship involved. Can't do it, not in mixed company. Uh, but trust me, it's ungodly, ungodly. So he goes from God is my judge to Baal protects the king. Hananiah, his name means the Lord God is gracious. Anybody believe God is gracious? Said the Lord God is gracious. It changed his name to Shadrach, which means under the command of Aku, the moon god. You go from God is gracious to well, you got a new God in your life. His name's Aku, and you're under his command. Michel, his name means there's none like God. There's none like God. Changed his name to Meshach, which means there's none like Aku. Very close. Totally different. There's none like a coup, the moon god. And then they changed Azariah, which means the Lord God has helped me to Abednego, which means in the service of Nebo, which is the Egyptian god of wisdom. So now they got a choice. Are you going to accept what the culture says about you? Are you going to accept what your friends say about you when they call you holier than thou or the, 
or, or they think you're out of touch or you're not relevant and you don't know, and you go to church and you actually read your Bible, you actually get in front and play instruments uh, and, and in front of people and you sing in front of people and you go to Bible study and you go to generate and you do all that. Are you going to, are, are you kidding me? Are you one of those right wing, you know, uh, closed minded, bigoted Christians that are hypocritical? Is that you? Or are you going to believe what God says about you. And what God says about me is that I'm saved by the blood of the Lamb. I'm a child of the King, and He rules and He reigns in my life. And all God's people say, it. Come on, somebody give God a hand clap of praise right there because that's true. Are you going to believe that? What are you going to believe? You're going to believe what their fr your friends say? You're going to believe what your family says about you? You're going to believe what the culture says about you? You're going to believe what your co-worker says about you? They find out that you believe God, that you believe in Jesus, that you actually believe the Bible is not a book of fables, that it actually was written by God. You see, that's Nebuchadnezzar's first order of business. Change the names. Change them. This is, this is who you are now. Uh, and by the way... Uh, that's what the culture is trying to do today. The culture today is trying its best to change the names of what we hold dear. <laughs> By the way, you do understand that's what politically correctness is, right? Uh, politically correctness is a war of words. That's all it is. It's just words. Let's change the names. Let's, let, let's change it. Let's don't, let's don't call it what it used to be. Let's be very careful and all-inclusive that we change the name of everything to get you to buy into what the culture says it is. I mean, it's just, this has gotten ridiculous. It's, it's gotten way out of hand. That, the, that one of the, recently, one of the new things that is just absolutely, this is how far this has gone. We're, we're told it is politically incorrect to call a roach a pest. Really? Yes. You do not call. That's, that's insensitive to a roach. I'm not, I'm not making this up. This is too stupid for me to make up. You don't call a roach a pest. You know what you call them? You call them a visitor. A visitor. <laughs> I'm serious. I, I am not make. There are people out there that say, don't call a roach a pest. He's just visiting. He's visiting your house. <laughs> well, you put me in pigeon hole you want to, but I'll tell you what, I'll go up to that visitor roach and say, welcome to my house, now die. Boom. <laughs> Get roach guts all over my shoe. I don't care. You creep me out. That's not political. <laughs> Save your emails, come on. <laughs> it's not political, you're correct. Now, I'm making fun of that, which, by the way, that is true, that people do feel that way. But what I'm saying is, politically correctness is nothing more than a war on words, and it's not, it is as old as the devil himself. What was the first thing that Satan said to Eve when he was trying to tempt her to go away from God? He said, has God not said? He planted doubt in her mind about the word of God. He put doubt in her mind that God is God, that God meant what he said, said what he meant. That's as old as Satan himself, and we're being hammered on that today. This is what you say. This is what your parents said. This is what your old preacher said. This is what your out of touch, irrelevant church said. But we say it's different now. Come join us. And that's as old as the devil himself. Amen? Amen. Change the name. Change the words to everything we hold dear. Creation by Creator God is now evolution from time and chance. Just give it enough time, give it enough chance, and that's how we evolved from fish in the sea. Uh, human life in a mother's womb. We've dunned it down to it's a fetus. It's just a fetus. It's a blob. An abortion is a mother's right to choose. And this culture has bought into that thinking hook line 
and sinker. Marriage is not between a man and a woman. It can be, but it also can be two men, two women. Doesn't matter. Homosexuality is called an alternative lifestyle. Sounds reasonable. Lessens the sting of it. But it still is what it is. Let's just change the name of it. Your gender is not what God created you. You decide sooner or later in your life what your gender is going to be. It's politically incorrect anymore to have gender reveal parties because we are told that you have to wait till that child determines what gender they're going to be. I'm not trying to be crude. I'm not trying to be unkind. But I can settle that argument right now. What gender you are, just look down. Amen? I'll tell you what gender you are, or I'm not going to tell you. Let your mama tell you. She's the one who bathed you. You decide. And, and, and we look at that and we say, well, there's no harm in that. It's, it, you know, all, all of this, it's, it's just the way the culture is. They don't mean anything about it. It's as old as, as, as indoctrination can get. Change the name. Here's the third thing. You don't have to conform to what the culture compels you to conform to. Now, let me say that again. You don't, listen to me, young people. Come on, teenagers, sit up, listen, listen. I, almost, I came this close, and I asked Andrew, I said, Andrew, can I get all the teenagers in one section today so I can just preach to them? He said, Pastor, you could, but it'd probably be pandemonium. I said, yeah, you're right. So I want you to listen to me. You do not have to conform to what the culture tells you you got to conform to. You see, Nebuchadnezzar wrote the book on how to indoctrinate. Nebuchadnezzar wrote the book on how to, you, you can stray from your God, you can stray from your parents' teaching, you can stray from what the church says, you can stray from what, what the pastor says or what the student pastor says or, or your parents have taught you. You can stray from that and you don't need that. That's outdated. That's irrelevant. It's past. You don't need that. You need this. You need the culture. You need to, you need to go along to get along. You need to get along to go along. And Nebuchadnezzar wrote the playbook on how you do that, and we're still using his playbook. This is up to date as it possibly can be. And involved two things. It involved indoctrination and assimilation. Indoctrination and assimilation. No, number one here, write this down. The first thing he did, he started them out young. Amen? He started them out young. They were young men. They were in their early teens, maybe 12, 13 years old at the most. Started them out young. Folks, listen. This is why that we're putting so much emphasis now on our preschool children and student ministries. And I hear some of our seniors, well, what about us? And my answer to that is, what about you? You already had your chance. You already had your time. You already, you, you, you were, you, if you're saved, you got your name in the Lamb's Book of Life. What are you worried about? And I hear people say, that, well, you know, preacher, we all went through peer pressure. When I was young, we all went through the same thing just like they did. No, you didn't. And no, I didn't either. This generation of preschool children and students right now are under more pressure, more indoctrination temptation than any generation in all of human history. And all God's people said, parents, you better know what they're being taught. You better know what's been out there. He started them out young. He wrote the playbook. Number two, he appealed to their intellect. He appealed to their intellect. I, I, I cannot believe that you go to a Southern Baptist church 
and listen to a screaming, fat preacher. Thank you for not saying amen. <laughs> You're very kind. I can't believe that you do that. No person, no intellectual person in their right mind still believes in hell. No intellectual person in their right mind still believes that marriage is a man and a woman. I can't believe you that. So he appeals to their intellect. By the way, by the way, listen, listen. it's always been that way. This is nothing new. This, this is old as Babylon itself. Because the greatest and listen to me, you listen to me say amen, come on. The greatest indoctrination to any culture is through the educational system of that culture. Oh, I'm preaching now. And let me say that again. The greatest indoctrination system is through the education system of that culture. So you better know what's being taught. You, be, you better go to parents' meetings. You better go to school board meetings. You better know. You better know what's being taught. You need, you need, to, enter, you need to go to your kid's room and say, let me see your computer. Let me, let, right now. Let me give it to me right now. You say, oh, good, do that. It's a free society. No, it's not. It's a dictatorship, and you're the dictator. You need to know. You need to know what's going on. Appeal to their intellect. That's what he did. And then thirdly, he encouraged them to do what everybody else is doing. You, you, you'll notice what he says. He said he was to teach them, as finesse, was to teach them the Chaldean language and culture. Now, Babylon was the kingdom, but Chaldean language and culture is the culture, this all, it's, it's the indoctrination, it's the system that was around them. They called it the Chaldean culture. It was a system that they were living in, just like we're living in a system right now. We have a world system that we're living in. In other words, indoctrinate in their way of life. Forget the other way of life. Forget the spiritual way of life. Forget what your parents said, what the preacher said, what the church says. Forget what you learn on Generate. Forget what you learn. Just do what everybody else is doing. Now, there's only one way to survive this. Listen to me and listen well. There comes a time you're going to have to draw a line in the sand. There comes a time when you've got to say no more. There comes a time when, when you've got to have such a conviction of what you're going to stand on that, that no matter what the culture says, no matter what the government says, no matter what anybody else says, no matter what your friends say, there comes a time when you've got to draw the line in the, in, in, in the sand. And, and you have to dare to be a Daniel. And so you've got to ask yourself, listen to me, who's king of your life? Who rules your life? Are you the king of your life? Then you're a sorry king. Who rules you? Do you rule your life? You're not a good ruler. Neither am I. You've got to draw a line in the sand and ask yourself, who is Lord? Who is boss? Who directs the direction of my life? Who does it? J.D. Greer said this. He said, you can't make a difference unless you're different. That's pretty deep, ain't it? You can't make a difference unless you're different. Listen to me, young people. Young, please, please listen to your preacher. I know, I know you think I'm not relevant. I, I get that. But listen to me, and listen, when I pour my heart out to you, there is no way under God's blue sky that you can believe the Bible, that you can, that you can uh, 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 adhere to the, to the teachings of the Word of God, there's no way that you can love Jesus and know Jesus and worship Jesus and not be different. People are going to ostracize you. They're going to cast you out. All of that. You, you just can't do it. You cannot be in the world and, and of the world at the same time. You can't do it. You cannot be different. And you got to draw a line in the sand and ask yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth losing some friends over? Is it worth losing some, you know, they, they, they're not going to elect me as class president because I go to church or whatever. Is it worth it? You've got to draw a line and say, listen to me, and listen well. Listen, 
The most famous story in the book of Daniel we're going to talk about in a couple of weeks is Daniel and the lion's den. Anybody ever heard of that? Well, when Daniel went to the lion's den, he was 80 years old. He was 80 years old when they threw Daniel in the lion's den. He's older than Pastor Jimmy. You can believe it. 80 years old. But listen to me, listen to me. Young people, listen. You don't have Daniel in the lion's den as a senior adult unless you had Daniel as a teenager purposing in his heart. Amen? You see, what Daniel, made Daniel such a tremendous senior adult in the lion's den is where he had drawn a line in the sand as a teenager. He said, I'm not going to defile myself. May not be popular. I may lose some friends. And by the way, listen to me and listen well. Those friends that you're trying to appease, those friends that you're caving in on, those friends that say, oh, come on, everybody's doing it, those friends will not be with you at the judgment seat of Christ. They will be with you. So who's your king? Who's your Lord? You got to determine. Verse 8 said Daniel determined his heart. King James Version, I like what it says. It said Daniel purposed in his heart. The Hebrew word is the word sum, and it means to set something in concrete, immovable. So let me ask you, come on, listen to me. Daniel purposed in his heart. As a young teenager, he had a purpose. What's your purpose? What's your purpose? What is it that you will stand for, even if nobody else stands? What is it you won't cave on, even though everybody else is caving? What is it in your life? What hill do you have you're willing to die on if you had to? What's your purpose? And it's easy to say, well, I don't really know what my purpose is. You know how you can find your purpose? Anybody want to know how you can find your purpose in life? Here it is. Let me tell you. Ask somebody else that knows you well. That's how you do it. Ask somebody else. You see, a lot of you don't know me. You probably think my purpose is to play 18 holes of golf every other day. But you don't know me. You don't know me. You want to know who I am? That's my sweet daughter right here on the front row. She'll tell you who I am. You want to know my purpose? Am I a hypocrite? Ask my daughter. She knows me. She'll tell you. She'll say, my daddy ain't all that, but he does love Jesus. I mean, you know, that's what she'll tell you. Ask somebody that knows you well, what do you think my purpose is? Let them tell you. What is it that you're going to draw a line in the sand? Daniel purposed in his heart. He determined in his heart. He assumed, cemented it in his heart. It only goes so far. And we're going to see as we study the book of Daniel, he wasn't a jerk when he did it. It's amazing how he did that. He never was a jerk. God used him and elevated him to be second in command of the whole Babylonian empire. And yet he never compromised one single bit. It's amazing. This is going to be a tremendous journey together. Don't miss a single week of it. If you bow your head, close your eyes. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you, Father, that you are sovereign God, that you're in control. You know what you're doing, and you know why you're doing it, and you know when you're doing it, and you know how long it'll last, and how long it doesn't last. But you also know that those of us that know you, we're safe and secure 
in the arms of Jesus, just like our student ministry sang about just a little while ago. What about you? Do you know that you know? You may not know what's happening today or tomorrow. I don't. I don't know what's going to happen this afternoon. I have no idea. I just know God's in control. He's sovereign, and I'm in Him. That's all you need to know. That's all Daniel knew. And God blessed it and honored it in his life. And the same Daniel that lived back then is the same Daniels that are here today. Father, thank you for your word. In Jesus' name, amen. How many believe God met with us today? Come on, put your hands together. Yes.